this is a Mega Mix 2003, as you can see here, three state. So you've got some CPLDs, you know, at PALS, um, oh, they're actually GALS to be correct, and they do say GALS, it's a GALS 16V8-20 um, I think. So yeah, and there's a few TTL uh, or CMOS chips there. We've got these little memory modules here, first inspection, can you see here this has been repaired, those two pins there but broken off from the other part. So to start it was given a black screen. Um, and I just carefully show you, just, you should wear an ESD wrist strap while handling these, they just kind of pull out, I just carefully wiggle it on one side, and then on the other, come on, you know you want to come out, see that? So you can see the little module here, can you see those pins are bent, so I'm sure that's not showing up very well, um, and that's because, as I say, someone I think has fixed this in the past, they've replaced that part there, either that or it's broken, it could have had an impact. One thing I noticed about this, can you see the board's got a curvature to it? There's a story behind this, this board was not supposed to uh, arrive actually, well, I ordered it and after about a month of chasing and chasing and chasing the tracking number, not revealing anything at all apart from the fact it had left Germany, um, it just seemed to disappear and I ended up getting the money back. And then a month after that month, it arrived, it arrived yesterday which is incredible, it's took two whole months to get here from Germany and the tracking has just said, you know, it's, it's in Germany, it's in Hamburg, all that time. So yeah, I've contacted the seller, because obviously I've had the money back, and said, look, this has arrived, I'll test it, see if I can use it, if I can, I might buy it off you, if not, I'm, uh, you know, I'll send it back, give me a delivery address, and if you pay for postage, I'll send it back. So uh, yeah, I won't be using the same courier he used, that's for, for blooming sure. Um, so yeah, I mean I'm a bit annoyed because well A it's took so long to get here, B there's damage there that wasn't explained, C there's a curve to the board here, but anyway we'll give this a test, and you might think this is a pointless exercise but actually there is mileage in this because one of the things I've found is these A2000 boards due to the different versions of them, you know the differences between them, and the modifications, some of which I've done to my other 6.2, this is a 6.2, um, it makes boards like this compatible or incompatible with other boards. So I'm going to try a number of things. We'll try it with a stock CPU, see whether it works or not. We'll try it with the A2630. We'll try it with the Terrible Fire TF534. And I'll try it on my modded 6.2 board, which has got some modifications compared to this one. And again, try those combination of things and try it in a Rev4 board as well. Because you may find, for example, this works perfectly in a Rev4 board, it struggles in a 6.2. I found that with some of the older boards. So in terms of connecting this up, I was a bit puzzled. You know, sometimes they say front and back on the board, there's nothing on there to indicate which way it goes round. But if you put it inside the case, the little slots here grip the side of it just the right distance for this, you know, to fit this way. So I'm guessing that's the correct orientation. And spoiler alert, I know that this one uh, boots initially with this one well, I think, unless I've got a bad connection on that uh, RAM again. No, it's booting from floppy there, there we go. And if you go into memory test, the previous time I did this, look, you can see 5 meg, we've got 1 meg on the uh, with the particular Agnes we've got here, 8372A, and we've got 4 meg from this particular board. Um, I'll have another look at that board in a minute, because the other thing I didn't explain, it's got two types of RAM on there, you've got some ZIF sockets as well, I think, so, uh, sorry, ZIP, not ZIF, ZIP zigzag interleaved package. Press F1 and leave this going. Last time I did this it failed when it got to the 4 meg I think on the card or some of the 4 meg on the card. I stopped the camera recording there and then it failed straight away and I started recording again. So you can see we've got a problem there at a specific address range. It looks to me like it's a problem with not just a single bit but whole you know words there. I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below. I've seen this before when the RAM expansion doesn't like the particular board it's in or it doesn't like something else that's in there with it. So for example, I've seen this with the uh, uh, 2630. Uh, I've also got an A2091 that we'll test here as well in conjunction with this, but until I get it working on its own, you know, with no other boards, there's no point in even testing it. So what we do know at this point, it doesn't seem to work on this 6.2 board that's had no additional modifications done to it. So I think because we've not even got past the stock CPU on this one, I'm going to test this next in a Rev4 board. So I'll get my Rev4 out, connect it all up, and we'll repeat the test. So this is the first A2000 board I covered on my channel. Memory. 
there we go, so I'll fire Meg again, test all. See if we get any further now with that. And the same problem. So that would suggest to me there's a problem with this board actually. Some of the ROM on there is bad. So not only did the seller send it with the worst courier ever that took two months to get here, it's faulty at the end of that journey anyway. So as you can see, I've been carefully removing these, I'm just reseating them. The interesting thing is, it isn't a repair that's been done to this. Every one of these has got like the last two or so, well it could be a repair, um, replace, you know, the separate, like these two are separate from the rest, um, these two are separate from the rest, these two from the rest. Um, and it's the same over here, so they must have had these of a certain length and then put the two there, which is, you know, you know, you get little bits like that where, you know, the edge is missing, it's just awful. A really cheap memory board this I just don't like that curve either so the way they need to get these out is just to prise the PCB edge away a little bit I let, let, that was a little bit too much there but trust me that's not the issue um, so you can you see these pins here bent again look how bent that is compared to those so it's awful absolutely awful uh, but I'll just reseat them all and we'll retry it just give it the benefit of the doubt maybe it's a bad connection from 20 odd years of being stored so all I've been doing with these is carefully cleaning the contacts here with a fiberglass pen, just gently. Straightened out the bent uh, pins, you know, the bent two uh, offset socket pins if you like, and then carefully, carefully just slide it back in to position like that so they're going in all right no problems at all uh, and then the tops of these where these have been exposed they're a little bit weathered can you see that it looks a bit awful there so again just being very gently just cleaning the top there because that bit's got like a little bit of oxidization on it but it's not going to be a problem <laughs> so testing again after cleaning up i also cleaned the edge of the zorro connector there as well let's just see if that gets any further or might not do if I've moved some bad RAM into a different area it might fail sooner but I think it was at the 400000 range wasn't it it could be something on the actual card itself something wrong with the address decoder or something yeah it was there same place failed at exactly the same place so this board does not work it's got some dodgy uh, address decoding somewhere so I reseated the chips that are on there as well as the RAM uh, it's made no difference I tried it in the last slot exactly the same problem so I might just test it in my modified 6.2 board so it's had most of the factory mods uh, you know applied to it to take it in line with the I'll bring it in line with the 6.4 but I did reinstall one of the resistor packs that it tells you to remove and I found that I had better compatibility with the number of RAM cards from adding that resistor pack that Commodore recommends you remove actually and the obvious thing before anybody points it out if you switch it to 2 meg it does actually work now, there is a chance one of those modules is faulty, um, but I think not, because the error it's giving, it's almost like an addressing fault, I think, rather than a problem with a specific bit or something. I'm not sure this is worth £70 for a partially faulty board. So I'm testing it now with a TF534 and a Rev4 board in 2 meg, just to see if it will boot. Uh, obviously, I've changed Kickstart here to 3.1, otherwise, uh, you know, Kickstart 1.3 won't auto boot. So if we just give that a few seconds, it should boot from the hard disk okay. Just make sure it boots up all right. Yeah, that's looking okay. If we just move the cursor around here, I haven't got a mouse connected. So you can see we've got six meg of other mem there. So two meg of that is from this expansion in uh, you know Zorro 2. Four meg is Zorro 3. So we'll just boot this test from floppy and test it on here. Yeah, and it's only gone around for one pass there, but there are no issues. It seems quite happy. So we'll move on to adding the A2091 in there. So booting up with the A2091 and we've got defective, as you can see. Um, interestingly, it's not pointing out the terrible fire there. I think it's saying the uh, A2091 is defective. Let me try the A2091 nearer to the uh, co-processor slot. Now this could be an incompatibility between the TF534, but I'm pretty sure it works on its own here. Yeah, you can see it's defective. I wonder if they're trying to allocate the same space. If I remove the uh, Mega Mix, switch it back on, let's just see if it's happy with just the 2091 in there. It's saying the A2091 is defective, I think. Oh, 
One thing I would point out is these RAM modules here are super hot. I mean, like, incredibly hot, all of them. So I felt it was worth just explaining something and expanding a bit on how the Zorro stuff works here. Um, now, the red screen we saw there, actually, I think if I continue past that, it probably would have worked. If you look back at one of those red screens a few seconds ago, I think one of them said the device was defective, but then I think it said it was okay on the next line down. Um, and that's part of the auto-config polling process. Um, now, there's a bug, and Liv2 made me aware of this, actually, uh, Matt, Matt Harlem. Um, there's a bug in Kickstart 3.1, but I wasn't aware at the time of filming this, so you know, I've added this bit in at the end to help you. Uh, Kickstart 3.1, sometimes the order that they've got cards in these slots here, as it goes and it tries to check the size of each card and whether it can accommodate. So you've got a RAM board, one's uh, 4 meg, and then you've got another 4 meg and another 4 meg. You can't possibly map all those in. The Zorro 2 address space can accommodate up to 8 megabytes. So the way it works is you know, it pulls the first card um, and goes, you know, what are you? I'm a memory card, I'm 4 meg. Meg, uh, okay, shut up. And then it's, uh, I'll explain how that works in a minute. It then looks at the next card, and that's a 4 meg one, and that's okay. And then it looks at the next card, you've got another 4 meg one, and it, that card there can't possibly be mapped in. It's used the 8 meg already in the first two slots, so it tells this card to shut up. Now, if you have a scenario where one of your cards is going to cause you a problem because it you can't quite accommodate, let's say you had 4, 2, and 4 here, you're going to get your 4 meg. Then it's going to the next one, you've got 2 meg, it's going to allow that, that's 6 in total. Comes to this one, it goes, oh, you've got 4 meg, can't possibly fit 4 meg in, so it's, it's told to shut up. And then I think maybe it goes back round again, or it requeries this card a second time. And because it's been told to shut up, it goes, all right, instead of giving you 4 meg, I'll have that, I'll give you 2 meg, is that all right? And then it accepts it. Now, I think with Kickstart 3.1, that's the kind of scenario where you'd end up with that red screen, where, it, you know, you can see the history there. You know, it's like, okay, okay, shut up, you know, not incompatible or whatever, defective, I think it describes it as. And that's the problem. It describes it as defective when it actually isn't. And then it repulls it and it gives it half the amount and goes, yeah, that's all right, you can accom I'll accommodate that. And you get sat there with a red screen. Correct me below if you think I'm wrong, but I saw evidence of that. Live 2 pointed it out, and I saw evidence of that testing something else recently, and I was like, ah, that's the problem. And I got around it by putting in Kickstart 3.2. Now, I think 3.1.4 does the same, and I think probably 3.9's probably got the fix in for that as well, that auto-config issue. And it's not really a bug as such, but it's just badly designed. Sitting at a red screen saying something's defective, when actually it isn't, it's just not being able to accommodate it within the memory space there when ultimately it has actually utilised that card and just gone with half the amount of RAM it was provided. It's, you know, it's, it's just bad design, isn't it? So in layman's terms, how does the auto-config polling work with the different cards and the slots? You've got this hit signal here, COP CFG. Ultimately, I think that probably comes from Buster or somewhere like that. And that signal comes here, it's pulled down there to ground, yeah. And then you've got one of these 74LS32s on each slot, yeah, for the config in. So when you initialize the system, you know, you reset the system, I'm guessing that these each card in each slot is going to put a high out on the config out pin, yeah, as default. So they're all sat there waiting to be pulled, but they've all got high on config out. Now, config out on the first slot, it comes up here like this and it's one of the conditions for this OR gate. So because that's high, and you've got a conditioner, you've got a high, yeah, you're going to have a high coming through here, yeah, into this OR gate, uh, but also, because that's the config in, the slot is disabled, you need a low, active low, on the config in to activate the card that's in there, yeah, to get a response from its auto config from the pick, I think they call it. Um, so yeah, you can have this high coming through, it's disabling this card, it's not, it's not low, config in, but at the same time, because you've got high, it passes through, disables the next one, passes through, disables the next one, passes through, disables the last one, etc. So everything along there are all disabled right from the start by virtue of the fact their config outs are all high, feeding the second, you know, uh, pin on these OR gates here. This first gate, whilst you've got high going through because of its config outs, the input here, that's low, isn't it? So this card is going to respond, it's got an active low config in. So in Zorro 2, that's going to respond to uh, an address. It's going to write to an address, I think. Um, there's a read-only part of the address. I think it's split into two uh, nibbles. 
or something like that. So you've got a ROM that sits somewhere, you know, read only ROM, but also you've got a, an address where it writes to, and it's going to, uh, and I think it sits, I'll stick the address up there for Zorro 2, uh, and then I'll stick the address down there for Zorro 3, the different. The Zorro 2, 64K of uh, address space there for these devices. And what does it write there? And the card that's in here writes to that address, and it identifies itself. There are a couple of bits in the bike there that identify what it is. I'm a memory card, I'm a hard disk controller, I've got a ROM or whatever. And uh, the size, for example, so a memory card, you know, might say I'm, I'm four meg, four megabytes, you know, where can you allocate me? Where can I fit? I think that's how that works. Um, in any case, the it's written to that address. The CPU then obviously, you know, processes and reads from that address and goes, all right, I know what I need to do with you kind of thing and responds to it. It either tells the card to shut up because it can't deal with it, it can't fit, allocate that space. You know, you haven't got, you've got two bigger card here, you've got eight meg and we've got four mega space left, etc. Or it's a four meg card, and we've got four mega space, okay, kind of thing. But in any case, after it's finished that process, the out pin, config out on this slot, then goes uh, low. And because it goes low, if you follow the chain up here, where we originally had a high coming across here from that config out, the active low, um, you know, the assertion now, this low signal coming here, because we've got a low and a low, this drops low, which means the next slot is selected. But this next slot, as default, just like the first one was, its out pin is high, yeah, which passes through this gate and disables the, the cards to the right. Does that make sense? And that's how it works. It's now dealing with this slot. So this one now responds to the auto config address, you know, identifying what it is and how big it is. And then the system processes and goes, yeah, all right, I can accommodate you. You're all right. Shut up kind of thing. Although shut up might not be the right terminology. That's usually what happens if there's a problem with it. It kind of just goes, yeah, all right, auto config's complete. So this one then, where it had a high on its config out, you know, disabling the things here, that suddenly goes low, which means, again, the selection signal passes through here, through here, you know, the low, you've got low, low and a low gives you a low, a low and a low gives you a low, comes through to here, we've got a low and a high here, yeah, because at this point, this one is, is ready to be processed, and it's got a high, it's out a high on its output, yeah, so then we're dealing with this slot, and the whole thing just continues on, so all five slots have been done. So I'll try and again without the TF534 with a stock CPU this time. You can see that's worked this time. We're going to turn the memory. So the A2091 on a Rev4 board seems incompatible with the TF534, but I do know it coexists okay on a Rev6.2 board that's been modified. This is the thing you see. This is where things get really confusing. I'm guessing if I now stick this back in, we will have four meg, and it should work. Yeah, it's not error luck showing 4 mega fast and Zorro 2. I found a similar thing with the Supra and you know the interesting thing is I'm wondering if something's going on in the 6 meg onwards address range that you know needs a modification because that Supra run board I had um, you might have seen in the previous video I'm not sure when I showed it, it that's a six, it had 6 meg on board it could be upgraded to 8 but it had 6 meg and I found a similar thing that when you reduce it to 4 meg on certain boards, it would exist with other cards and things, and it would exist and it would work fine. As soon as you switch to 6 meg, you've got the same exact problem. So what I've shown in a previous video, the A2630, you leave the CPU on here. It's only the uh, terrible fire you have to remove that. And you need it on there, you can switch between the standard you know 7 point whatever megahertz and the 68030 and you do that by holding the mouse button down I think so you can see now that has actually picked it up 6 meg so let's test that I'm just watching the address range here because that address range there was where it failed before now that tells me a few things the fact it, it works now with 6 meg at that same you know going through that same address range where it was failing shows that it is something on that card rather than something on the motherboard perhaps to do with that address range so it's not like we have motherboard faults or something along those lines. So just looking at the A2630, here you can see this is zip ram here. Um, zigzag interleaved package. So you know if you look at the pins, the, the, the go for each chip they go in a zigzag pattern like that. These might be the exact chips that are needed. So we've got two meg with those four clusters there. You can expand this to four meg look. 
they might not be exactly the same size and you might get different size modules I don't know because I don't know if you can see this is 4 meg, 6 meg, 8 meg, 4 meg, 6 meg, 8 meg so uh, yeah they must be larger maybe they're larger I'm not sure yeah I mean this curve here could be something to do with the fault and why 2 meg of it doesn't work but the card edge there is relatively straight it's just the back end of the board and I'm guessing I've seen this before it's probably not being bent over time it's been bent by these sockets when you stick loads of sockets like this on a PCB when they are soldered they cause curvature as it pulls it a certain way I've seen the same thing on some Neo Geo carts where someone's swapped out the chips and put sockets in there so I put the red 4 board away and we'll uh, just retest with that 6.2 with two of it disabled. So stock CPU, we've got 2 meg there. I think that's looking good. So I think it's the same as the red 4. I think there's something wrong when you enable it in 4 meg mode. So now I've got the A2091 in there as well. That should give us another 2 meg. See if that works. And I think that's hanging, isn't it? Yeah, so it would appear on this board those two can't seem to coexist. I can try and swap them around because I did have them in a different order before. I had the A2091 nearest the CPU slot there, you know, the coprocessor slot. So the 2091 is nearest the coprocessor slot now. Yeah. And that's the other interesting thing. Sometimes you've got to juggle around the slots that these go in. Some cards are happier to be nearer the slot and others will work uh, in any of the slots. When I say nearest the slot, I mean the coprocessor slot, nearest the CPU. So it went round one full pass there, still going round, no problems at all. So I think the next thing I'll just quickly do is test it with the TF534. So on the TF534, as you can see, it's coexisted with the Multimix board and the A2091. We've got 9 meg in total there. You know what, I'm starting to wonder how much RAM is actually on this board. It says it's 4 meg, but if you change the jump to 8 meg, you will see it actually thinks it's got 8 meg, despite the fact it hasn't. It may well be that there is only 2 meg on there. Yeah, I think in summary, I think this is 2 megabytes. I think you've got 1 meg, 2 meg. Because uh, if you look at these here, can you see? I'm trying to make sense of this. You've got 4, 6, 8, 4, 6, 8. So I think if you wanted 4 meg on here, you'd have to populate that position, that position, that position, that position, four of them in total to give you um, an extra 2 meg. So it must be like two of these must be 512k each, you know, 512k, 1 meg, 2 meg. So you'd add an extra 2 meg here, which should give you 4 meg. Um, and then it's the same with the other ones. So I think this is a 2 meg RAM expansion, not a 4 meg RAM expansion. It's super cheap. You know, they've got glue there, solder instead of uh, nice gold plated contacts and stuff. Curve in the board, yeah, not impressed. And these modules here, the, the baking hot. You have this powered up just for 30 seconds and these are baking hot. So after complaining to the seller that this isn't a 4 meg module, I mean, well, complaining is not the right word, I contacted him and said, look, I've tested this, it's okay, it's 2 meg, yeah, I mean, it's got a bend in it, you know, it's okay, I could pay you a bit less than it's worth, because it's not 4 meg, you sold it to me originally as 4 meg, and now bear in mind I haven't paid for it yet, so I said, the options are, I can either send it back to you, you can have it collected, or I'll pay you, I don't know, 20 euros less, I think, I think I said between 20 and 30 euros for the additional RAM, which I would need to take this up to 4 meg. And he said, don't worry about it, I'll send you the 4 meg and you can pay me the original fee. So I was like, all right then. So he sent these uh, four chips, you can see here. So a bit of a zoom in, hopefully you can see the part number on that. So these are, they must be thinking about this, uh, four, four bits each, yeah, four, eight, 16, yeah. So these are gonna be four bits each holding uh, two meg, presumably. Is that right? Yeah, it must be, because there's only four of them. Uh, and they go into, you can see that on the board here, you've got four, four, six, six, eight, eight, four, four, six, six, eight, eight. So, uh, and they go this way. Now, the only way I could work that out was finding some screenshots, you know, images, photos, of this exact memory expansion pre-populated. And uh, you could see the part numbers are here and the part numbers here. So they do all go that way up. So the chips are firmly in. So we've got to plug that into the 2000 and check it's working. So it's still not working. I'm testing it on a different motherboard here. You can see four meg detected. The chips are in there. They're in there the right way. 
I have alternated them around a little bit to see if the error changes and it doesn't really seem to. It's kind of looks like some sort of a dressing problem to me rather than the actual chips themselves. So this memory expansion I think does have a fault on the 4 meg uh, you know, boundary, you know, let you see, that's the error I've been getting. Although we're getting different uh, pattern there, it looks like it's specific bits rather than the whole lot. What I was seeing previously is like a line there, a line there, a line there, all the way across. So there's something crazy going on. The other thing I thought I could do before I consider just telling the seller, look, I don't want this, you can have it back. Um, swap out the 245s, there's some 74 LS 245s on there. I'm guessing this, we've got two for the data uh, bus and one for the uh, some of the address lines. So I'll try the one on its own first of all. The other two have got like a the same size resistor pack next to them, which make me, makes me think those are on the address bus. I'll try that, see if that fixes it. So I uh, tried swapping out the uh, two four fives. That made no difference. I swapped around the I think some two five sevens on there. Same behaviour, exactly the same every single time. The one thing that is interesting, if you remove one uh, or half of the uh, chips there, you get a sort of different error. You know it kind of moves around a bit which makes me think you know it's like one half you can see like we've got dash 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 xxx dash 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 xxx it's like one half of that is an issue i think although i can't quite make sense of what the x's are does the x indicate a fault does the dash indicate a fault i am not clued up as to how you read the output of this particular diagnostic software yeah, I mean, in any case, it would seem to suggest it's a half, isn't it? It's like one half in each case. It's never an individual bit. So although I've seen where there's only been three instead of four, etc. there. So, but it doesn't seem to follow. The point I'm trying to make, it doesn't seem to follow the change of the RAM chips. If you swap the RAM chips around, it doesn't change. But if you remove them completely, you get a different behavior. So I, I do think it's an addressing fault on the card itself. It's not um, addressing the RAM properly. So ultimately I returned that to the seller, he exhausted all options here, swapped all these chips around here, you know, reseated them all, swapped the buffers, swapped the, I don't know, the 253s or 157s or whatever they were, swapped them around, the behaviour never seemed to change, you always got those bits, you know, a number of different bits showing up as an issue there, and you would swap the, the, chi the chips here. Yeah, different ways around and the pattern that came back was the same regardless of the fact you've moved them all around so there was something wrong I think with one of these gals on here the traces and things were alright I spent hours messing with this trying to understand what the actual cause was I think it was just a bad gal you can see the dip switches down there that was a fatal mistake this video would have been about 4 minutes long had I seen that at the start so yeah a couple of lessons in this video Firstly, inspect your board, you know, look at your silkscreen markings, look for jumpers and dip switches, make sure it's configured correctly for the amount of RAM that's actually on it. So it was sold to me, you know, as a 4 meg board, but it wasn't, actually it was 2 meg the way it was configured. What's crazy about that, and why I don't like this Megamix, I think it's a Megamix 3, um, I don't like these uh, SIP packages here they get super hot after just 30 seconds of being powered on incredibly hot which is bound to look how many many ram chips there are. look how they're all sandwiched together like that there's nowhere for heat to get out it's uh, amazing it even still works to be honest uh, but also you know the the warpage in the board that's caused by all, all these crazy sockets installed here as well what was wrong with having a load of more of these here and just having those along there it'd have been a lot less space a lot less chips so sorry it was a short video hopefully you found it interesting i know it was a bit waffly you know lots of just looking at the screen me testing things might get a bit more interesting in the next couple of parts we've got some different cards to look at uh, with different issues and the things and yeah it's just interesting to see how the quality and uh, the capabilities of these cards vary a bit I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the Coffee and Patreon links down below. Every donation of a dollar makes a huge difference to the continuation of this channel. We will get onto some more interesting repairs and things soon. I'm just trying to work my way through some old videos here, and with my health being super bad this last month or so, I literally have been having to just edit some of these old crusty videos, ones that are kind of postponed, putting, putting off. But uh, anyway, hopefully you found it interesting. Catch you in the next video.